part of the life of a Christian is that it starts with baptism, where we speak very openly about death. Uh, we die with Christ in order to rise with Christ, and it will be our own death that begins the process of the fullness of resurrection. So dying is something which is central to the whole Christian understanding of living well. It's part of our privilege to be with people, not only in the moment of baptism, when there's the joyful aspect of the hopes of life eternal, but also as the extension of life on earth draws to its close, there are the moments when we are with people when they die. And also the moments when we are with people when they have become ill and are in pain at any stage of life, young or old. So being with people as they die is part of our experience as priests, it's part of our ministry. How beautiful it can be. I was uh, working in Leicester and it was um, a very elderly, gracious woman in a home run by the local council for the blind. She was not in pain, she was not ill, she was very old and her life was coming to an end. We prayed together. She had a vision of heaven and joy at the thought of being with God. And the words which she spoke again and again were words from uh, Newman's hymn. Uh, lead kindly light, and with the morn those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since and lost a while. And I learnt something profound from her, that this inner vision and hope transports us through death into life, because already for many Christians there is all, uh, an investment in the reality of the life that is as yet unseen. More recently, uh, the death of a friend of mine, a much younger woman, who uh, had uh, lived with cancer and finally the cancer overwhelmed her. She came to the end of her life filled with the wonderful strength of Christian conviction. The sense of reality, physical almost reality of the resurrection as her own body kind of gave way beneath this literally consuming illness. The strength of that conviction uh, was overwhelming uh, from her and it really sustained everybody who was with her. And she went into hospital for tests on a Wednesday evening and they said, oh, the tests are not good. I'm afraid we, we need to keep you in uh, and we think you may not go home. So she was there for Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And it was like reliving the, the days of the, the last days of the Lord's death in, that we celebrate in Holy Week. Friends came her family, her husband and her son, her mother and her brothers. This sense of also being very close to Jesus Christ um, and the church was important. She, she was a great supporter of the church. There was lots of conversation and, and there was some, you know, there was some laughter and lots of tears, of course. And when there wasn't anything else to say, and certainly during the quieter parts of the night, this extraordinary business of just reading the Psalms and psalms that she had chosen, which were her favourite words, were very important, and all from the Book of Common Prayer. She was a young person, but they mattered to her. And that, that spoke to me very powerfully about the resources that a Christian builds up through the processes of their own life of prayer, the resources of scripture, the resources of the faith of the church, the resources of the creed, you know, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, the resources of the Eucharist uh, on which she had been fed uh, and in which the breaking of the bread had revealed the risen Christ in the midst of his church. One of the things which I was profoundly moved by was something which I think people who work in hospice and end-of-life care are very aware of and that is the importance of touch. Touch says something to us about the very importance of this physical body. We aren't disembodied souls, we are embodied creatures. And the material hope of resurrection, it's not that this, is, this body is unimportant, this body is a part of us. And holding a person as they prepare to die says something about the absolute dignity of the physical body. And it's one of the reasons why the rites of Christian death and the Christian funeral does focus on this material uh, aspect. In a, an age, in our culture, where death is often quite remote from us because medical science is so good, we live so much longer, so we're less familiar with it really, and it can therefore be much more frightening for us at a later stage in life. Often I think children cope quite well with death and get their minds around it. We as adults have 
become more heavily invested in staving it off and it's therefore more frightening. And Christianity is important on touch, the laying on of hands, the anointing with holy oil to strengthen someone through illness, certainly an illness that comes to death. That's again an important statement of touch. And I think as human beings we want to be embraced. It's one of the primary needs that we have as tiny children. It's also a primary need as we approach death itself. And this speaks to us about the embrace of a loving father uh, as the way we speak of God who will embrace us in death. Living the Christian life is about living life to the full, focusing on the positive. So to talk about preparing for death should not be interpreted as meaning that we've always got an eye to the fears of death as a shadow that's cast. If we live in the sense that this world is good, the experiences that we have are amazing, um, but they are all preparatory for something which is the perfection of this world. That should give us some sense that actually the positive drives us and our reflections on preparing for death are not morbid but filled with some sense of expectation and joy. And the reality that of course we are all one day going to, to die. One of the things that I think all clergy know is that those who've not made any preparations for death can sometimes leave their loved ones with some real challenges, having then to think through arrangements for the funeral, yet another burden to carry. And of course sometimes an unexpected death, the tragedies that befall us uh, through terrible accidents and atrocities means that we never know when this might happen. Therefore having some realistic sense that we are ready for death at any time is not morbid, but is a statement that the provisionality of this life this is for the time being, but there is something more and real and permanent beyond it. Ought to be a characteristic part of our discipleship. All of us will have things to dispose of. One of the things that I think is important is if we are good stewards of what God has given us, both our personal gifts, but also material, things that we possess. There is a question of how we wish to dispose of them when we die. And I think we ought to dispose of them well, caring for those that are dependent upon us, but also dispose of them in a way that is going to express our Christian hopes and values and virtues, and is going to want to continue the um, causes that we have embraced as Christians. I hope we would want to support the church with some of the material gifts. So remembering your church as, as a legacy in, in Will. Indeed, making a will and ensuring that we also leave funeral instructions so that actually what we have experienced as Christians, what are the aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I've really loved and, and want other people to rehearse when I die? I think that's what should go into leaving some instructions for your funeral. In today's climate, hope is a, is a very interesting virtue for a Christian to practice. Partly because we live in a climate of uncertainty, of turbulence, uh, of conflict. The numbers of people who live with depression you know, seem to rise uh, constantly. Terribly, terribly alarming to see the number of young people who live with depression. And hope is, of course, the virtue which pulls us through depression and gives us something um, firm to hold on to uh, and look forward to. And hope is something to which we are called as Christians. When Jesus says, follow me, come with me, he is planting in our hearts the hope of something, the hope of being wanted, being loved, the hope of being that most amazing person that somebody else has chosen because you have something which nobody else has. You alone have something. Use your life, your skills, the person that you are, in an amazing, remarkable way. This is the foundation of Christian hope. And in a time of turbulence, where people uh, often want to cling to certainty, I think as Christians, we believe that hope is, is bigger than that. Because certainty 
is often very limited, whereas the Christian hope is about something which is always expanding, the sense that God is always greater, there is always more, the horizon is ever beyond us. And the joys, as I've already said, that we experience now, we hope and believe, will expand. And again, I would go back to the Psalms. One of the loveliest Psalms was Psalm 27. My heart hath talked of thee, seek ye my face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And that's the way Christians have across the centuries tried to put into words this hope. It's the hope of seeing God face to face. And I don't think that means like sort of being on a sort of talent show on telly or something, where suddenly, da-da, uncovered, you think, oh, that's what God looks like. Oh, very nice. It's not that sort of superficial uh, thing. It's something about seeing which is more profound. It's about the moment when you turn a corner and there's a vista which takes your breath away. It's the moment when you see for the first time your child. It's this sense of seeing. It isn't about the sight, which means I can tell the difference between what is blue and what is green or light and dark. It's also about this inner vision. Um, and that's why the, the woman who was very elderly and blind still had an even more remarkable vision you know, which was taking shape, the vision of God for whom she longed. The Christian tradition can often be heard to be very negative about desire, so that's a bad thing. Actually, it's one of God's greatest gifts to us. What is it that you desire? And of course, we can desire things which will be destructive for us, but at its best, what we desire, what will make us happy, that is our heart's desire. And true happiness that lasts, that is the desire which our hope uh, believes will be fulfilled. Desire for possessions, you know, whatever they might be, never really satisfies deeply. Desire in relationships gets closer, perhaps, to it. Desire to be loved, as well as to love, begins to outline the greatest and deepest hope. And to desire to be loved by somebody whom we can love beyond our widest, wildest dreams, that seems to me to be the heart of what it means to see God face to, God, face, to face. And in doing so, not to be alone, but more deeply connected with everyone else than we've ever hoped. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. That would be my prayer of Christian hope and the outcome of our calling when Jesus Christ said, follow me, I will take you to the Father and to the vision for which you long and hope.